This is the radio documentary produced in 1998. The discovery of Trinidad that all the other Western Malayans, which is the teacher of that. But it's an internal history. You did because you think well, it went back far enough. You know, from the days of slavery to the which they never taught taught you about the slavery, the days of slavery to go there. There were still slaves there. When I say slaves, I don't mean slaves. There were still people that taught and lived exactly the same way, although it was what, in the 19th or 20th, 30s. There was Miss Lizzie there, and she used to roll her tobacco, and she used to, you know, she lived exactly like her mother lived in the world. She went into the 18th, you know, we learned about this fella, Wilberforce, you know, who, who abolished slavery, and so on. Okay, um, that was uh, Arthur Miller, and that was the first unclear sound. Uh, it's not, not, not a very close recording I was able to make. But uh, I just wanted to let you hear uh, this man's voice. Um, so there is Harold Phillips, uh, interviewed by BBC Radio Merseyside. Um, the, one reason why I selected that quote, um, the first part, which is harder to hear, was we learned British history, this is in Trinidad, we learned British history, we knew more about the kings than the queens and what happened in old England than we knew about any other area. And the tape cuts out where it says, Columbus and the discovery of Trinidad and all the other West Indian islands. Uh, these are the things that he emphasizes having been taught at school. So you can see how it is quite a sort of white um, British colonialist narrative that was uh, given in the schools, the kings and the queens, um, Columbus discovering. Um, the days of slavery, they never taught, so he's talking about the 1930s uh, as a youngster in Trinidad at school, they never taught about the experience of slavery. What they were taught about in these schools, he says, was uh, Wilberforce abolishing uh, slavery. So it was this narrative as, oh, Britain was so great to abolish slavery without mention of what Britain had actually profited from slavery. So I... Um, I use that example because, unfortunately, this kind of pattern does spread into the, uh, the, the, the kind of historical narrative or, or mis-narrative that Haroon alluded to with the story of Bob Dylan's mm -hmm. daughter. In 1998, this article appeared in the Observer newspaper. Um, I have tried hard to, uh, to contact this author, Tony Henry, who is a journalist and also a musician. Um, I, I haven't been able to contact him despite sending various letters for possible forwarding. Uh, I suspect he never received the letters. But I, I, I need to say, with, without Tony Henry's research and publication of this, again, I probably wouldn't have known about this story. Uh, the article interviewed uh, Woodbine himself, who's the same producer as the, uh, as the radio clip, and it also <coughs> interviewed various uh, contemporaries and friends of his in Liverpool Lake. They all describe a very similar story, um, how these two young white teenagers, John and Paul, were often seen observing the steel bands. Um, I'll just enlarge this quote, this is what Lord Woodbine said. It refers to a poster for a play in Liverpool in 1992, uh, where the image we saw earlier of him with the Beatles had been airbrushed so that he and others disappeared from it. Uh, he was quoted as saying, when I saw that I had been airbrushed out of the picture, it really hurt me. Maybe the great Beatle publicity machine didn't want any black man associated with their boys. That was uh, a comment that was uh, that appeared in, in this newspaper. Um, I don't know how many the time. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, so. Um, Let's have a quote from Paul McCarthy about all this. 
This is Paul McCarthy in the foreword to a book published, uh, Wondrous Place by De Noyer. It's about, uh, all about music in Liverpool. McCarthy uh, wrote this. The big factor about Liverpool was it being a port. You could get so many different ethnic sounds, African music maybe, or calypsos by the Liverpool Caribbean community, which I think was the oldest in England. With all these influences, from your home, the radio, the sailors and the immigrants, Liverpool was a huge melting pot of music, and we took what we liked from all of that. I don't want to, that, that's not the full extent of this foreword. He writes about various other musical influences within, um, within Liverpool. That, that last line, we took what we liked from all that, is it, potentially quite a, a loaded quote in terms of uh, perhaps exploitation and perhaps uh, appropriation. Um, but I also want to emphasize this is something that's come up a lot from my own interviews with people. Is that how it was witnessed uh, was that this was more a matter of giving than sharing. It wasn't a matter of pure exploitation. It, th these were young friends, these different musicians. So, you know, history, the passing of time has the capacity to, uh, to distort in, in, in that way too. I think it might be insulting to everybody to say that the people simply took what they wanted from, um, from black musicians and that was it. It was um, more in a spirit of sharing and uh, mentoring. Okay, now, uh, someone said this to me this morning and I, 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 I agree with uh, <coughs> I've had this said to me many times. Well, okay. So, for these people, uh, Woodbine himself, but uh, to a limited extent, he didn't like talking about his years with the Beatles. He very reluctantly agreed to be interviewed on uh, about five occasions, but uh, tended to talk more about his background, his interest in um, Steel Pan and Calypso. He didn't seem to like being asked about the Beatles. Um, so, someone said, well, and I've asked this myself as well. How do we know that this narrative is true? Uh, how, how can we have faith that um, this isn't just some, some kind of urban myth that's sprung up? Well, um, the point is, Lord Woodbine was not the only uh, black musician in Liverpool who acted as a mentor to the Beatles. Liverpool's black music scenes in the 1950s and 60s were very diverse. Uh, with Steel Pan and Calypso, both of which Woodbine was involved with, but also uh, gospel in various churches, rhythm and blues. Um, and uh, there's a four part, uh, five part harmony with the Brother Chants as well. So, this is an image of Vincent the Volcanoes, uh, this gentleman playing guitar. His name was uh, Vince Toe, T O W. He later changed his name to uh, Vince Ismail. This is what uh, Vinto's manager told me. Um, so, uh, Vinto's manager, George Roberts, saw his, uh, his young guitarist. So, Vinto was Somali Irish. Uh, he was based in Liverpool, late Toxter, but owing to the kind of constraints and the kind of prejudice that was operating in Liverpool. Um, black musicians found it very hard to get bookings outside of the so-called black area. Uh, George Roberts, in promoting Vinnie Ismail, was one of the first people to get such bookings, and uh, they crossed paths, Lerner McCarthy with the young Vinnie Toe. George recalls, this is how he said it, um, <coughs> Lerner McCarthy had two passions. One was R&B, the other to become famous. They would never have got that sound if they hadn't turned up in Liverpool's black district. Vinnie freely shared his expertise with other musicians, including Lennon and McCartney. He taught them Chuck Berry riffs. John found it difficult. My main memory of John with Vinnie was John saying, show me this, show me that. Vinnie was eager to show a friend. Something to emphasize here is that George Roberts, as I said, Liverpool's um, black music scenes were very diverse. George Roberts did not know Lord Woodbine. 
Um, and yet what he describes is a very similar pattern of the young John Paul having a fascination with um, Liverpool's black music scenes, and they seem to investigate all of the aspects of those scenes. Now, if you think about the Beatles' career, part of what made them extraordinary was um, their willingness to take on new styles, new approaches, and to incorporate them into their own sounds. Think of their use of the sitar or uh, avant-garde electronic music. Motown, um, think of the White Album and things like your blues, it's got Scar with Over the Over God. The Beatles were always on the lookout for new things to work into their sound. This process appears to have begun in Liverpool in the late 1950s. Odie Taylor was a Liverpool-born African-English jazz guitarist. Um, I interviewed uh, one of Taylor's colleagues, George Dixon, who, who recalls uh, the young John and Paul often attending Odie Taylor's uh, performances at Liverpool's White House Club. And uh, one, one of the people I, uh, I interviewed, uh, I've now decided more to, I can't remember the exact source of the quote, uh, but somebody told me that uh, they heard the Beatles, uh, next time they heard the Beatles play, playing, people were saying, and there wasn't anger about this, people were saying, oh, they've got some chord techniques from Odi, the sound had changed. So Odi Taylor, as uh, African English jazz guitarist again, seems to have been an influence. Um, here is uh, Little Richard with the Beatles and three members of Liverpool band uh, The Chance. Okay, so the chants um, were backed by, they were a vocal band, and the Beatles gave them instrumental backing uh, at the Calvin in 1962. Apparently, the Beatles manager, Brian Epstein, tried very hard to persuade them not to do this. The reasons for that are not known, but it, it, it does have um, a potentially unpleasant ring to it, doesn't it? Um, the Beatles disobeyed that. Uh, one of the few occasions when they disobeyed Epstein in the early days uh, was to, uh, to back the chants um, on stage at the cavern. And R Ramon Sugardine, who has been um, a great friend, um, has been very generous to me this time, what he recalls of this. He describes hearing uh, the Beatles rehearsing in the cavern and three-part harmonies were a huge part of the Beatles' sound. Um, they seem to be um, adapting that technique in particular in a style that reminded Ramon Shubedeen of, of the chants. Fitzroy Jimmy James, a uh, steel panist, um, after Lord Woodbine um, had uh, left the uh, Royal Caribbean Steel Band, another band was formed, the Royal Caribbean Steel Band. Jimmy James was, uh, was the tenor panist for, for that band. This is what he says to uh, a colleague of mine, David Bedford. He says, uh, we all knew John and Paul in particular because they were hanging out in the Jack, that's the Jackaranda Club, all the time. That's where the steel band used to rehearse, the Jack Jackaranda Club. I won't claim that we were best friends, but we would talk together. They were obviously interested in the sound we were making and observing what we did. Paul was a great guy, though John was more standoffish. To me, Paul was a keen observer and a smart guy who was always trying to learn something new. He would pick things up really quickly. I remember when I moved to London in 1967 and was playing in the speakeasy. Paul and Linda came up to me and we had a really nice chat because he still remembered me. People then came up to me and wanted to know how I knew Paul. And I told them a bit, but I never wanted to boast about it. I, uh, I might be wrong about this. In some ways, I hope I am wrong about this. But in talk, talking about um, white domination of how history gets told, um, this thing of don't want to be seen to be boasting, and also uh, some interviewees have spoken about a fear that they would somehow not be believed. Um, so I'm very glad this, is, this topic is being researched a lot more now. Um, 
I'm using this quote uh, as the last example of this. Um, Xanax Logi. I don't know if that is the correct name. Maybe part of that name is a nickname, or maybe part of it is misspelt. But Lord Goldbine himself was uh, quite keen to point out that uh, this, uh, this colleague of his, a Guyanese guitarist, Xanax Logi, had, uh, had taken quite an active role in mentoring the young Lennon on guitar. Woodbine said, Zanx was always showing Lennon something until he died in 1994. Zanx was proud of how he taught Lennon to play guitar. The reason why I've uh, used these quite similar quotes is to make the point that um, these come from diverse sources. A lot of my interviewees didn't, and still don't particularly, know each other. Now, they certainly didn't know each other at the time. Yet yeah, what they're saying, you can see a pattern, can't you? Okay, so, how many time for them? Okay, so uh, I, won't, I won't go on for much longer because I won't put the time for questions.